Hi everybody, welcome to another shitty couch vlog. And this time it's my five worst couples from cartoons and anime. And originally I was going to be calling this the five worst couples from anime because, because as people probably should know, I tend to watch a lot of anime that tends to have some kind of romantic subplot, usually somewhere in there. But there aren't really like that many anime couples that I just flat out hate, which is why just to get that nice round five in there, I decided to throw in one couple from uh, a Western animated series. And one last thing is that I want to stress that these are all official couples to some extent. There are a few annoying caveats to a couple of these, including the first one that I'm going to talk about. And once again, just as with the fonts video, I want to stress that these are just my opinions. Don't take these too seriously. I just thought that this would be something fun to talk about. And the first couple that I'm going to talk about is from an anime series that I sort of touched upon in my B&W reviews, and which wasn't featured as an official video, but I touched upon it specifically in my video on what I thought was the worst Tenchi Muyo episode. Now, as I've mentioned before, Tenchi Muyo is a harem comedy, and I touched a little bit upon what I consider to be the big lie of harem comedies, is the fact that the only way the series is able to keep going is as long as the main romantic storyline keeps going on, or the way Tenchi Muyo does it, where Tenchi doesn't explicitly show romantic feelings for any of the girls on the show, and if he does, it's very incidental. And therefore, any official couples on Tenchi Muyo is a kind of nebulous concept. So that's the annoying caveat for this one, is that technically, if you wanted to see it that way, you could see Tenchi having a relationship with pretty much all the girls, or none of them. So if you wanted to know what my OTP for Tenchi actually is, I personally feel it's Ryoko. The two characters pretty much have the most history for each other. And anytime anything bad happens to Tenchi, Ryoko is usually the one that reacts the most violently. Which kind of just tells me that that love is just pure. Also, she's like one of the three girls who's not related to Tenchi. So as I touched upon in that particular video when I was talking about the episode strategy, obviously the worst coupling for Tenchi as a character, in my opinion, is the character Noike. Now the reason I dislike Noike a lot comes from the fact that she's introduced so very, very late in Tenchi Muyo. I realized this about myself with series that I have a hard time getting on board with new characters introduced in the midst of a series a lot of the time. And the most annoying thing about Noike as a character is that there's a great potential there for her and Tenchi to have an interesting relationship because they're basically being forced into marriage. Neither one of them particularly likes the idea, but neither one of them also dislikes the other one. But like I touched upon in that video, Noike is just... Um... She's just really boring as a character. Tenchi is a pretty blank slate, too. I mean, he's kind-hearted, he's courageous, though not like crazy brave. Like, if bad shit happens, he'll still react appropriately. But he's a likable, average Joe guy. His role in the whole equation of the Tenchi Muyo series is to be the straight man, and all the girls are the clowns that he's kind of reacting to. And that's the problem with Noike, is that she really doesn't have any interesting personality qualities. And the other thing that I really hated about that episode strategy was the fact that they try so desperately to make the audience like her. They tell all the stories about how she was adopted because her parents were alcoholics or something. And sure, that's all interesting background and everything, but, but that doesn't mean that I actually care about you. I mean, she's a cop by profession, she's kind of strict with Mihoshi, which I mentioned isn't something that I particularly enjoy, and she has an amazing rack. But that's about it. So really, there's not a whole lot to this couple, so that's why I wanted to discuss them first. They're just a really bland couple, and really, I felt during Season 3, they just tried too hard to make Tenchi and Noike come together. Because really, I don't see any chemistry between them. Particularly, the final episode was the most inexcusable one, where they literally have Washu tie up the other girls so that they can interrupt the big heart-to-heart -heart moment that Tenchi and Noike are having. And our next bad couple is Green Lantern and Vixen from Justice League Unlimited. So a little backstory here, the OTP coupling for Jon Stewart, of course, as anybody who watched Justice League and Justice League Unlimited knows, is Hawkgirl. But there's a pretty complicated backstory there. 
But that's the thing, that romance evolved naturally over the course of the Justice League series, and it was actually a pivotal plot point in the series finale for Justice League and before Justice League Unlimited began. And what I also like is that that storyline also spills over a little bit into the JLU side when Hawk Girl rejoins the Justice League after having betrayed them and then betrayed her own people. But then, during the second season, just completely out of the blue, John ends up together with Vixen. Now, I really wouldn't have that much of a problem with John just kind of moving on and getting a new relationship. I mean, that's fine. And here's the thing about JLU, it was a pretty big ship fest overall, whether you're talking about Green Arrow and Black Canary, or The Question and The Huntress. And the only disappointing thing is that, that there weren't really any gay or lesbian couples, unless you count like Lex Luthor and Brainiac. But here's the big deal. With all of these different ships, whether it was the Green Arrow Black Canary ship, or Question and the Huntress, or Supergirl and Brainiac 5, or Lex Luthor and Brainiac, is that there was an actual build-up and a history to everything that happened. Like, even if it took them only a single episode to get there, that's the problem I had with the John and Vixen ship, was the fact that it just came out of nowhere. Just suddenly, at the beginning of one of the episodes, they're a couple. Unlike with the Tenchi Noike situation, I don't think Vixen's a bad character. In fact, one of my favorite things is that she and Shaira actually become friends after she gets together with John. And their interactions are actually pretty interesting. It's just this couple that doesn't really do anything for me. And really, I hate to play the race card here, but, but did they seriously ship John with the only black girl in the Justice League? Really? So yeah, the same thing as with the Tenchi no Ike thing, the real problem with this ship is that it's just kind of boring and there's really no history to it. Alright, and next up in our bad couples is probably the most iconic bad couple in all of anime, and that of course is Goku and Chi Chi from Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z. And maybe some of the other ones, sorry, I haven't really watched Dragon Ball Super, so I can't really comment. Now here's the deal, I don't think Goku and Chi Chi in and of themselves are terrible people or anything like that. The only problem with this coupling is that it's kind of, that it comes together kind of artificially. Goku promises to Chi Chi when they're kids that they'll get married even though he doesn't understand what marriage is, then they meet as teenagers, they get married, they make a baby, but then, as Dragon Ball Z showed us, Goku is like the number one worst husband and father in the universe because he spends like half the series being dead. And mind you, Dragon Ball is the kind of universe where that necessarily doesn't prevent you from having another baby with your wife. And here's the thing, I think Akira Toriyama went a little bit too out of his way as just depicting Chi Chi as the dragon lady overprotective mother type. And they just kind of play off her suffering in this relationship as a joke. But really the episode that shows it in a kind of tragic way is the episode where Goku and Piccolo try to get a driver's license. Yeah, I love that episode, but you seriously do feel bad for Gigi at the very beginning. And the kind of sad thing about this is that it's not even that Goku is just super neglectful, it's just the fact that he kind of just forgets that, oh yeah, I have a wife and everything, don't I? I mean, Vegeta is a bag of dicks, but at least he genuinely loves his wife. Man, that's a statement I thought I'd never say. Alright, the next couple that I need to talk about, of course, is from one of the B&W reviews, and this is something I touched upon very heavily. And excuse me if I get a little heated under the collar, because this is something I feel really strongly about. Now here's the thing, I love this particular series, but it has got to have one of the most frustrating main couples of any harem comedy I've seen, and that, of course, is Keitaro and Naru from Love, Hina. Now here's the thing about Keitaro and Naru. It's not necessarily that these characters had to be a bad couple in and of themselves, and I kind of do like a little bit what Ken Akamatsu was doing as the series was going on. The real problem for me is that Keitaro and Naru are the kind of characters who are sort of unwillingly destined for each other, but Ken Akamatsu then tried to do everything in his power in the series to try to not seem like they were just somehow magically uh, meant for each other even though they totally are. It all hinges on that little thing which is the childhood promise that Keitaro made to the girl he liked, who then later actually turns out to be Mutsumi. And somebody I think commented on the Love Hina video actually that they felt that Mutsumi and Keitaro should have totally ended up together, which I 100% agree with. 
Mutsumi is a little mischievous, but she's genuinely a very nice person, and I just can't get that bow out of my mind. Whereas Naru is just kind of abusive and judgmental. The main thing through most of the series is that Naru is just convinced that Keitaro is a massive pervert, even though it's all kind of a, just a misunderstanding. And that's something that kind of bothered me about her character the first time I watched the anime, although as time went on, it eventually became kind of just a running gag, and I just kind of got used to it. But as the series goes on, Naru eventually learns that Keitaro is actually a genuinely nice guy, because, duh, he is. He's just super unlucky and always ends up in embarrassing situations. And then it becomes all about the fact that, that Keitaro is just such a big wimp, that he can't bring himself to tell Naru that he genuinely loves her, even though it's kind of completely obvious. So that's already something that kind of rubs me the wrong way about this relationship. And that's the only hiccup between this whole Keitaro and Mutsumi thing either, that, that no matter how close they get, he just has Naru on his mind. But here's the thing, I didn't like the fact that in Love Hina, again, they basically just kind of flip the roles around where it's now all about Naru not coming clean about her feelings for Keitaro, and that's why all this bad shit keeps happening to her. And again, it's all kind of very artificial writing. There's not like a naturally developing romance there. Things just kind of always escalate to some ridiculous degree, until the characters finally just blurt it out. It would have been a much better payoff also if Keitaro was still more consistent with the way he was being portrayed on the television show. But as I mentioned in the BMW review, the other thing that they kind of did in Love Hina again, which really annoyed me, was the fact that all of a sudden Keitaro was this hunk that all the girls were fawning after. So yes, they are a bad couple, but then again, I do have to admit that realistically it came down to either Mutsumi and Naru, and Mutsumi kind of realized at some point that, that Naru and Keitaro are sort of me meant for each other, even though that kind of still doesn't make any sense to me. So she's super cool about it, which is honestly a little sad if you ask me. But on the other hand, if Tenji Muyo's big hookup is the fact that, that some of the girls are actually like related to him, in Kinter's case, I'm not super opposed to the main ship just because half the girls in this show are underaged. And finally, we come to School Rumble. Now here's another coupling that I have a few annoying caveats that, in this case, the coupling is also sort of unofficial because it only formally happens in something that is not officially considered canon for the series. So the basic setup, there's a girl named Tenma and a guy named Harima. Harima is in love with Tenma, but Tenma is in love with, with this guy called Karasuma. And the whole series kind of revolves around all the comedy as these two are trying to confess their love to the other person. And in the end, Tenma and Karasuma do officially sort of end up together, although it's a slightly tragic thing because in the end it turns out that Karasuma, who is a bit of a weirdo, apparently has some kind of memory disorder. So School Rumble officially ends with Tenma wanting to look after Karasuma for the rest of their days. Wow, that took a dark turn for this series. Harima, on the other hand, officially doesn't end up with anybody, even though Tenma's sister Yakumo and one of her friends, Eri, are sort of the official love interests for him. But here's the thing, Harima is completely oblivious of the fact that Yakumo is in love with him, and he has a very, very prickly relationship with Eri, which also doesn't really translate into romance most of the time. But here's the thing, Jin Kobayashi, the creator of the series, has technically made one of these two ships official. Because in the manga School Rumble Z, which follows the story of all the kids after they leave high school, Harima ends up going away, Eri goes after him, and then in one of the issues of the manga, it's shown that the two of them have a child together. The annoying thing about this is that Jin Kobayashi has stated that School Rumble Z is not officially canon. But considering this is the only place where Harima gets any kind of conclusion, I'm willing to say this is the quote-unquote official ship. But as you all might have already guessed, I of course have a huge problem with this because I'm firmly in Team Yakumo in regards to Harima's relationship status. Now here's the thing, I don't flat out hate the Harima Eri ship, but there is one key problem I have with it, and that's the fact that Harima, for the most part, just really hates Eri. That's not in a way where he would actually want bodily harm to come to her, but it's more in the way that he kind of views Eri as an obstacle between himself and Tenma. And their interactions are usually very negative and terrible, 
But then when bad stuff happens, despite his fierce exterior, Harima is still nice enough of a guy that he'll still help out Eri when she's in, like, real trouble. So from that perspective, I can kind of see why Eri does eventually develop feelings for Harima. But none of that really explains how Harima would have any feelings for Eri. Whenever Harima is nice to Eri, it's only because he feels sorry for her. With Yakumo, however, Harima actually considers her a friend. And Yakumo is nothing but nice and supportive to Harima. This all kind of culminates when Yakumo becomes an assistant to Harima when he's drawing his manga. But because he keeps the manga side of this relationship a secret from everybody else, everyone comes to the mistaken conclusion that he and Yakumo are dating. Which he's aware of and actually feels sorry that Yakumo constantly ends up in trouble because everybody just assumes that they are dating. Which shows one key difference between his relationship with Eri and Yakumo. He has genuine concern that Yakumo might end up, end up in trouble because of him. He actually feels genuine guilt over this whole situation with Yakumo. Whereas with Eri, it's more like, yeah, if he has a chance to have some fun at her expense, it's okay. But if anything really bad ever happens to her, that's not cool. So that's the problem I have. I honestly can't see what Eri would have done to Harima in order for him to actually want to have a baby with her. I mean, I can imagine a few things, but somehow I doubt that would be the canon version of the events. So tell me, is there a couple in anime, or really any cartoon show, or movie, or anything that you feel was maybe a little forced or didn't feel right? I love to hear from you guys, so leave those bad couples in the comments. I'm Hunter the Hunter Mackinan, and see you on the next one!